Hello everyone, welcome back to the next part of the lecture on the hydrologic cycle. Um, we're going to continue on talking about atmospheric rivers. So atmospheric rivers are thin bands of high water vapor transport in the atmosphere. Uh, and they're shaped predominantly by prevailing winds that kind of funnel this um, current of uh, high water vapor. And they can carry a pretty huge amount of water. Um, some atmospheric rivers carry as much water as twice as much as the Amazon River. Um, so these are huge volumes of water moving through the atmosphere. Uh, and you can see here, this is the fraction of the total rainfall from the year um, that the area receives um, from atmospheric rivers. And along the coast of the United States, over half of the rainfall is a result of atmospheric rivers. So this is a significant process that really dictates how much rainfall um, the West Coast receives, and to a lesser extent, the East Coast as well. Um, one important thing, though, is that atmospheric rivers tend to be very flashy. Um, they're they can dump a huge amount of rainfall in a short amount of time, and therefore um, they can cause a lot of flooding. So knowing how they form and um, being able to predict them is, is very important for knowing when flooding will occur. So the next aspect of the hydrologic cycle that we're going to be talking about is the cryosphere. So the cryosphere is all of the frozen water um, in in the earth so this includes all the glaciers snow permafrost sea ice ice sheets and icebergs and and so on um, and so the ice in these systems can move around uh, and melt and contribute to the hydrologic cycle um, so ice forms through um, compaction of snow so snow has a very low density, and as it sits out and um, gets covered by more snow, then the air spaces between the snow, the ice crystals, starts to compact, and uh, until it reaches um, a point where um, those air spaces are no longer connected, and you have closed off um, air pockets, and that's when we call it um, glacial ice. Um, also, um, glaciers move. Some glaciers move extremely fast on the order of tens of meters per day. Um, that's because um, glacial ice is a viscous fluid. Um, so it flows just like honey does, um, but just on a much slower scale. Uh, and we call that um, plastic flow um, because it, it moves um, and deforms um, plastically um, as it moves down a slope. There's a um, each glacier is kind of divided into two different glacial zones. So the upper area of a glacier is called the zone of accumulation, and that's where um, you have more snow accumulating than you have snow that melts throughout the year. Um, Whereas further down on a glacier where it's warmer, um, you have the zone of ablation where you have more melting um, occurring than snowfall. And um, snow that accumulates in the accumulation zone uh, flows into the ablation zone to make up for that mass loss. Um, and that imaginary line between these two zones is called the equilibrium line, or the ELA, the equilibrium line altitude. Um, so each glacier will have um, a variable um, area of the accumulation zone as well as the ablation zone. And it's a good way to think about um, a glacier as it moves, moves downhill. Uh, another big component of the cryosphere is sea ice. So sea ice covers um, large portion of the ocean in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, and there are many different types of sea ice. Um, so the, the first um, type of sea ice is called frazzle ice. Uh, 
So the, this is just individual ice crystals um, that form a slush in the ice. And it's the, um, the first ice crystals that develop. And they're not really connected with each other and they can flow. Um, you probably experienced slush to some degree um, yourself. Um, and then um, as that ice um, gets colder and colder um, and uh, develops more, it can follow down two different paths. Um, and those paths are dictated by how rough the ocean surface is. If you have a lot of wind and a lot of waves developing, um, it follows down a cycle called the pancake cycle. Whereas um, if you have fairly calm conditions with not a lot of wind, um, you follow down the congelation um, cycle or growth rate. Um, we'll talk about that first. Um, so so um, in very rough oceans, um, you have the formation of pancake ice. So pancake ice is just um, these little disc-like um, formations of ice that develop and they're formed because um, as the ice starts to form, the waves break up um, the ice into these little disks and you don't have a, a complete um, matrix of ice develop. Um, but as you get colder and more ice develops, um, you can start to get rafting or ridging or fingering as you start to get these large larger expanses of ice develop and because that ocean is really rough these larger expanses will ram into each other and get pushed on top of each other or they'll um, put, uh, slam into each other and form a ridge or they'll kind of finger um, together and, and get sheared into each other uh, so usually um, in rough oceans you have uh, also very rough surface of the ice that develops. And then eventually those, um, that, that ice will get cold enough to um, cement together and form a more cohesive and consolidated layer. But um, for a calm ocean, you have a slightly different process. So first from the frazzle ice, you then develop grease ice. And you can see that uh, here. The water is so cold, it's not allowing the, the snow to melt when it hits the water. And it's called grease ice. It looks like a layer of kind of, I guess, oil in the water. So there you go. Grease ice. So as you can see there, that, that it forms this um, thin layer of, um, of ice where the frazzle ice has kind of stuck together and formed this very thin layer um, that kind of gets a grease-like reflective surface to it. Um, and so as that grease ice starts to develop even more, um, you can start to get what's called um, nilas. So nilas are these um, larger, delicate strips of ice that develop in calm oceans. Um, and you can see that these people for scale as to um, what these nilas look like. Um, and then as um, these nilas develop even further, um, they tend to um, run into each other. Um, and you can have rafting um, and um, fingering together as well. Um, we call it zipper ice as they um, kind of zip themselves into each other and, um, and form multiple layers. And you can see that, that here, so these um, kind of long um, uh, cracks here is when um, you have these nilas that get pushed up against each other and they interlace with one another one another and they shear against each other um, and that's that's what we we call um, fingering or, or rafting um, and eventually 
those um, layers that get pushed up onto each other, they'll start to um, go through congelation, which is just the multiple layers freezing to each other and forming into um, sheet ice, which is um, here you can see that process kind of forming um, and there those different layers kind of building up. And then sheet ice is when you have complete coverage of relatively thick um, ice over the, the expanse of the ocean. And so um, the larger expanses of ice um, we call ice flows. Those are kind of like the icebergs equivalent of sea ice. Um, so icebergs come from glaciers, whereas ice flows come from sea ice. Uh, another really cool uh, phenomena that can develop are plinias. So plinias are um, holes in sheet ice. So um, sheet ice can be thousands of square miles. And sometimes when you have a warm pocket of air, uh, warm pocket of water develop, you can melt away um, a hole and form what's known as a plinia. Um, and these are really important because that warm water generally is very productive. And so you have a lot of sea, uh, sea life that congreg congregate into plinias and you have a lot of um, productivity and ecosystem developing in these plinias. Another um, aspect of uh, sea ice is shorefast ice. So this is ice that has frozen onto the shoreline. So it lines the entire shoreline um, and it does not move. Uh, and it can last there for, for years. And so um, this is called Tuvek um, in uh, North Slope, Alaskan. Um, and generally um, you have this ice freezing to the coast um, and you also have ice that's um, pushed into this um, area of shorefast ice and you have a pressure ridge develop as that um, those, those ice flows collide, it forms pressure and those, that ice gets both pushed up as well as pushed down um, and it forms this ridge and the uh, elevated portion of that ridge is called a sail and the lowered portion of that ridge is called the keel and the keel will dig into the sand and mud and make sure that that um, shore fast ice also stays in place. And so the shore fast ice tends to be much more stable than areas um, further out to sea where you have moving ice flows and ice shearing against each other. And so um, shore fast ice is very important, especially for native communities um, for seal hunting or, or whale hunting um, where they can rely more um, readily on, on being able to stand on um, that shore fast ice as they hunt. Um, another important aspect of sea ice is the sea ice albedo feedback. So um, ice has a very um, high albedo. It reflects a lot of light, um, reflects 60 to 90 percent if it's snow covered or 40 to 60 percent if it's not snow covered. And so um, because it reflects so much sunlight, it cools the area around it. Um, whereas if that sea ice melts, then that ocean water absorbs 90% um, or more of the sunlight that it hits, uh, that hits it. Um, and so um, the area can get a lot warmer. Uh, and so um, the as the as more ocean water is exposed you have um, a warmer climate that develops and so more sea ice can melt and this goes into a positive feedback loop um, with more and more um, sea ice melting and that leading to more and more um, uh, warming so that's a, a like a vicious cycle that develops um, and that's why 
sea ice concentrations are so important for regulating global climate. Um, and if sea ice is lost, then the Earth can absorb significantly more solar radiation. Um, and it's also one of the reasons why the Arctic is warming significantly more than the rest of the planet. Uh, this is a process called Arctic amplification, in which the Arctic seems to be warming at a rate nearly twice as fast as the rest of the planet because of this sea ice albedo feedback loop. And you can see here that the extent of sea ice has been drastically decreasing. Um, you can see the extent in um, 1984 compared to 2016 where a um, significant amount of ice has been lost and whereas you used to have uh, over 2 million square kilometers of very old, well-developed sea ice, nearly all of that um, multi-year ice has melted and the majority of what's left is only one or two years old, um, which makes it um, much more vulnerable to more melting um, in the future. Um, we can see here these are the sea ice extents for um, the end of the summer as well as the end of the winter. Um, winter sea ice extent is relatively constant, but summertime sea ice extent has been rapidly falling. Um, we see here that it's um, at less than half of the extent that it, it used to be just 40 years ago. Um, additionally, the melt season has been getting longer and longer. Um, sea ice used to only melt between um, mid-June and um, mid-September, but that season has extended um, nearly a month and a half, um, allowing sea ice to melt for a longer period of time and therefore the extent to, to drop more, more easily. Uh, and if we use climate models, we can predict um, how much sea ice melting there will be under different climate scenarios. Uh, and so you can see the um, decrease in sea ice extent that's already been recorded. Um, and then climate models can either show us what the business as usual um, sea ice extent is, and that's in red, as well as the um, rapidly addressing carbon emissions scenario in blue. Uh, and the scary thing is that um, we see that under a business as usual scenario, then summertime sea ice will be completely gone by 2050. Um, and that will have very dramatic effects, not only for the climate, but for ecosystems um, in the Arctic um, and the people living there. Um, and so um, the, the only way of, of saving that sea ice is to um, put in measures to significantly um, decrease our emissions because sea ice concentrations are only going to go down. Um, you can see this in a map view. These are um, climate model predictions for the amount of sea ice that will likely be lost um, in Antarctica, in Antarctica due to uh, a business as usual climate scenario. Um, and unfortunately, by the end of the century, um, sea ice along West Antarctica um, could potentially completely melt away. And this is um, very bad because the majority of melting of glaciers in Antarctica is due to um, warm ocean water hitting the glacier and melting the terminus of the glacier. And if there's less sea ice, then more of that warm ocean water um, can hit the glacier and therefore more melting occurs. And there's that's another positive feedback loop um, that will only make melting in Antarctica even worse if um, we continue down the path that we're on right now. Snow cover is also changing rapidly. Um, we talked about this um, briefly um, in previous lectures. 
um, but we'll go into a little bit more depth. Um, so snow cover changes with latitude, elevation, uh, and precipitation rate, uh, and as well as with the, the temperature. So um, areas with higher latitude, um, such as in the High Sierras or the Rocky Mountains, tend to have higher snowfall rates um, and more annual snow covered. Um, whereas um, areas lower down, even at similar latitudes, um, might have less. Um, but also as you move closer to the poles, you have colder conditions and therefore um, more snowfall as well. Additionally, you have the lake effect, which can add more moisture into the atmosphere. And you can see that's why we have so much snowfall um, right around the Great Lakes. Um, that's because you have moisture from the Great Lakes that um, evaporates from the lake, um, goes into um, the atmosphere, and then gets snowed out as it moves over land. Um, and gets caught up by the, the mountains and the friction um, that go on there. And that's that orographic lifting that we talked about. And so generally around large water bodies, you tend to have um, a lot of precipitation. And in this case, because it's so far north, a lot of snowfall. Uh, if we zoom in on New Jersey, New Jersey also receives a good deal of snowfall. Um, maybe not so much this year. But um, this is the, the average um, annual snowfall in New Jersey. And you can see that that's concentrated in northern New Jersey around the Delaware Water Gap area. Um, and that's because you have that elevation there as well as the higher latitude. Um, we've seen these, these plots before. These are the um, change in snow cover um, for each season with the fall snow cover um, increasing, the winter snow cover um, staying fairly stagnant, and the spring snow cover um, dramatically decreasing. Uh, and the end effect of this is that we have a slight um, decrease in north northern hemisphere snow cover, um, and that, that decrease is fairly significant. Um, you have nearly 200 thousand square miles of area that's no longer covered in snowfall. Um, and as we get warmer and warmer, that decrease is expected to rise as well. Um, so your random phrase for this week is, the frog's name is Fred. Um, Fred is the frog, the frog's name is Fred. Um, so um, also the duration of snow cover is decreasing. So um, we have um, a fewer months out of the year where snowfall is actually falling. Um, and that's especially true in um, Europe um, and Western Asia, um, where you have significantly shorten shortening of that snow season. Um, uh, whereas some areas, especially in the Himalayas that are getting a little bit more precipitation, um, might be increasing it. The general trend is that you, we have um, much less um, uh, snowfall occurring. All right, um, let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to uh, talk all about permafrost. <laughs> 